Welcome to the Founder Insights Podcast by Animoca Brands. I'm Rich Robinson, EIR at Animoca Brands. And today I am joined by the co-founders of the Edge of Company Incorporated. And these guys are the most excellent founders of this really dynamic, fast-moving media and event company. And they're all about uh, Web3. I was just at their insanely awesome possum event, Edge Outer Edge, put on by the Edge of Company and the Edge of NFT podcast, which is one of the most bestest top podcasts in this space, in the multiverse. And uh, they put on these great experiences and they're launching new podcasts and they are just a giant steaming mug of Awesomeness. Welcome to the pod, Ethan Janney and Josh Krieger. Great to be here. Great to be here, Rich. And uh, yeah, man, uh, it's great to have a, a fellow Bostonian sort of in the mix at Outer Edge, uh, leading the charge as, as one of our Wicked Pissa. trusted uh, MCs. Uh, you know, we knew you could bring the energy. That's for sure. You know what I really loved about the outer edge event in LA is that LA is so eminently suited for web three. And there were very much true believers there. And a lot of people with their hands on the controls who were there and it was incredibly well curated. You guys really pulled together a fantastic set of speakers from William Shatner all the way to our uh, esteemed co-founder and chairman Yatsio, uh, to Bobby hundreds and many, many others. Well done. Thanks. It, it was definitely a team effort and, uh, also shout out to our other co-founder, Jeff Kelly, who's not on this show, but, um, the three of us have sort of been there from the beginning building, um, building this, uh, media content and event sort of, uh, ecosystem. Fantastic. And let's uh, peel that back a little bit more. Tell us about what you're excited about right now during this bear. There's still so much amazingness to, uh, to build and to, to cover. And uh, let's also go into the origin story bitten by a radioactive NFT uh, back in the day, please. Yeah. I mean, on, on the first point, um, you know, we just had uh, Hennessy uh, Cognac on the show, um, you know, one of the subsidiaries of LVMH. And uh, Danielle said it so well, um, something that uh, Ethan and I have talked about a lot, which is um, the best use cases for Web3 don't happen overnight. They don't just... Um, you know, get created and then you hit go and, and you have this speculative asset. They're built on a foundation of, of true community and, and true utility and they're done authentically. And that's what, you know, um, Hennessy is all about right now. They have their Discord, they have their um, lounge type or club community for, um, for Hennessy. And a lot of it stems from a project where they they felt like they rushed in a little bit too quickly and they didn't necessarily have the trust vibes that they needed with the community. And so, you know, that is a reflection on the space as a whole. Um, a lot of people rushed in, um, not enough trust, not, a, not enough vibes, um, not enough sort of not the right language for uh, broad adoption. Uh, it's not easy to go to a world, um, maybe in your own country, it's our, and, and have to speak a different language, right? Um, to, to need a translator um, by your side the entire time. That's not a recipe for success. It's not just about the utility. It's not just about, um, you know, the the sort of innovation, the disruptive capabilities. It's about tailoring this tool to your audience and doing it in a very thoughtful way over a long period of time and uh, using it in a way that that relates to all the other technologies um, that are out there and are available to you and um, doing it in a way that's authentic to your particular 
brand. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to work, period. That's great. And I know that you guys speak to a lot of different players in the Web3 space, and I'd love to later go into other projects that you think have done it um, very well, building community and trust. But let's talk about the community and trust and authenticity that you guys have built and uh, the journey that you've been on with uh, the edge of company. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, that. Yeah. Inception, please. Yeah. From this. So this all started with a podcast. So it's fun to be on a podcast and it was fun to like talk to you, Rich. I think we chatted a little bit before you launched your podcast. Like it's the, the origins of podcast is fun. Um, we, we came up with a kind of a, an intro and a thesis for our podcast very, very quickly after getting together and, and uh, me and Jeff kind of sat down after Josh introduced us and, you know, it was the top 1% in NFT NFTs today and what will stand the test of time. And, you know, right there, we were giving ourselves a bar, right? N number one, we want to talk about things that we think are high level, right? Um, w w it's not just about anyone and anything that's going on. And, you know, um, of course, we have, have, have fun and, and cross the gamut of what people are interested in. But we really wanted to feature people that were, you know, high, high caliber, high level things going on. And then also that and will stand the test of time thing. Even from the very start, we started before the kind of run up to the explosion of, of hype and everything going on um, and rode that wave. But from the very start, we kind of we, we knew, right, it, there's something about this that you need to think about the long term. Right. What will stand the test of time? So um, so that that came into the podcast from the very start. And, and actually, jo Josh and Jeff knew each other from before uh, starting that. But I didn't know these these guys that much. You know, Josh and I met through a networking group of great, great folks. Um, but we were kind of getting scratched to the relationship. And from the very start, I was like, wow, I am I'm on board with some guys with some real deep integrity, too. You know, and so uh, we had that running through the course of everything going on. And, um, you know, Josh and Jeff had, had founded a, a distributed food tech company that did quite well and grew very large from, from a small focus um, on the East Coast. So, so that all grew into the event, you know, and, and that was similarly curated in a way to focus on what's most important. You know, Jeff uh, talked a lot in the beginning about his, his sort of vision that was building in his head about something that's highly curated. Right. It's not a cavalcade of, you know, oh, I think I know who that is and where did they come from? And, you know, what's that? Is that really their resume or is it not? You know, it was really like we want to introduce you to what we think is the best of the best. We want to keep you in your seats. Right. We want to we want to curate an experience for you that's well thought out and not just a hodgepodge. Um, and so that's been the theme of of the event since we started it as NFT LA and then grew it into what is now Outer Edge LA. And then, you know, we continue again to focus on high level and really giving people a high caliber experience, not only of the speakers, but also the experience and the pe the other people that they're going to engage with at an event. And we'd rather have an event with uh, a smaller curated, you know, number of people that you're really going to be happy that you that you met with and and networked with than you know having it be something that's heavily diluted not that we can't expand to huge event sizes but it's that we'll always be focused on that top one percent and what will stand the test of time in everything we do yeah absolutely and you know um it, it just sort of felt right in terms of um getting together with our unique backgrounds and and and, and sort of pulling off this content um that started it all which was the podcast um, my background, um, intersects with Jeff's background in quite a few ways. Um, I started in management consulting and actually did a lot of interagency sort of cross, um, cross pollination bridge building, um, you know, type of initiatives, both within the federal and commercial sector. And then, you know, I got into, um, entrepreneurship because of Jeff, he kind of pulled me along with them and, and sort of uh, showed me that there was a, a bigger opportunity here to make a bigger impact, something I was looking to do anyways. And uh, we started a, uh, a sort of, an, we did an event 
Um, and we did some other pop-up events, but the big one was this fusion type event, the Funky Fresh Foodie Fest with a bunch of different um, experiences and live music and, and sort of mixing together things in a way that hadn't been done before in DC. And it was quite popular. Uh, Ford came in and sponsored it and we had self-driving car, uh, self-parking cars at our event. Um, so it, it was very branded. And, um, you know, after that, um, we, we had a big board and, and we went after a problem that sort of intersected with a lot of trends that, um, you know, at the moment are, are sort of really stood out to us. People that wanted to eat well, didn't have time to cook. Um, people uh, were going to CrossFit more, yoga more. Um, what did all this mean? Uh, you know, it, it led to sort of a curated sort of restaurant call, crawl, if you will, of prepared meals that you can order online and pick up at your local gym um, twice a week when you're already going there to work out. And, and then, of course, post-COVID hit, and we had to turn that to a home delivery company. But fundamentally, we co-created meals with chefs. We co-labeled them. Uh, we shared revenue with them. And we also built a decentralized architecture that um, you know Jeff had, had conceived. And, and basically, I went around the country and onboarded uh, chefs. Um, we trained them. And we taught them a new way of doing business. These were traditional restaurants that were now sort of working um, in a decentralized manner for us through a hub and spoke model. And that hadn't been done before. This is before sort of, you know, ghost kitchens were a thing, right? And fundamentally, a lot of those philosophies apply to Web3. Um, you know, a tribe-like culture, building sub-communities, uh, co-creating, uh, making sure that there's a win-win sort of in a partnership, really making that happen. And, and that's translated to our business. We've had over 200 partners uh, in just two years. And every one of them is similar, but different. Uh, everyone's needs are similar and different, but it, it comes down to, you know, intentionality to create something bigger than what you can sort of create independently. Um, it takes it takes a team, it takes a community. Um, and we've just continued to sort of evolve what that means in, in, in the realm of, of pushing the envelope of emerging technology and community and uh, really have, have experimented and, and celebrated both the wins and, and, and the bruises along the way. Indeed. And we'll get into those bruises, your tribulations and uh, triumphs, but uh, thanks for sharing that. I heard the word curation a number of times in a few different contexts and web three often it is said that community is the core and it is um, it's a challenge to build that community. But if you look back, some clues, some like popcorn left along the trails, like LinkedIn had a very small curated invite only community in the beginning and Facebook used only .edu domains. And, you know, in some ways, even like, you know, Tesla had like a very, uh, you know, uh, kind of um, elite early user base that then, you know, translated into this more mass consumer. And I think that's, uh, an, you know, an excellent sort of guide, you know, uh, guideposts along the way for other companies that are looking to build their communities. How do you, how do you curate and how do you get the right kind of kernel, uh, if you will, along the way? You guys have done that well. Thanks. Um, you know, I, 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 I think when it comes to curation for speakers, um, for our events, as well as, um, you know, guests for the podcast, um, you know, we, it comes from, it's an art and a science, um, similar to how we chose delicious meals at, at, at our previous food tech company, Territory Foods, right? Well, well played. Thanks. Well played the same, yes. The, you know, delicious speakers. The, the, the food genre applies to a lot of things in life. Um, you know, uh, yeah, broccoli is good for you, but you don't want to eat it all the time, right? <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, um, you know, we wanted to mix... Um, a, a wide variety of backgrounds and perspectives together, um, not only feature builders, but founders, but, um, you know, creators, uh, you know, talk about the capitalist side of it. It's, 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 it's real. It's still there. It's, it's, 
you know, um, a lot of people uh, would like to think that Web3 is built by community only, but there's a lot of venture capital in our space too. And um, some of it has been healthy for the space and some has not been as 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 productive or supportive um, to the end goals. Um, but we talk about all of that. And then we also want to hit all the different aspects of the use cases, which is everything from gaming to the metaverse to arts, entertainment and music, um, culture, real estate. Um, so we're pretty excited about that diversity of, of use cases as well. And we try to sort of mix it all together with interesting people having elevated conversations. And, and um, there's no like perfect science to it, as I, as I mentioned. Um, it, it, it comes down to sort of, um, you know, is this at the edge? Um, you know, is this a, a unique uh, voice in the space? And, you know, it comes with a, a little bit of a burden of responsibility um, that you can't fully avoid. Um, but we do look at other leaders in the space for advice and insights along the way. We don't sort of, um, you know, pretend to, to know everyone that's doing cool things. We have blind spots. And so you lean on advisors and, and sort of um, other news sources and, and whatnot to sort of help you with that curation process. And um, you try to sort of set the conversation up in a way that it's interesting to you. If, if you were, you know, we think to ourselves, if, if we were watching this play out, would we find this entertaining? Would, would we tune in for the next episode? So, so that's a little bit of, of the curation mix. Did I leave anything out, Ethan? In terms of, yeah, in terms of curation of the, of the audience. I mean, the, the first things that I think of is just, um, a lot of this started with people that we already knew, right? And um, the very interesting folks that were doing interesting things and word kind of spread, you know? We, we had fun in the very beginning uh, having like Scott Page from uh, saxophone player for Pink Floyd early on the podcast, right? And, and, uh, and it's like, oh, wow, this guy was in Pink Floyd and he did stuff during, you know, the tech, previous tech booms and things like that. And uh, he's really into NFTs and wow, he's got some crazy amazing ideas. And it was really interesting to have the guy on very early on. And he was going on and on about all the things he was doing to NFTs. And I was just getting started myself and understanding them. And I was like, is this all possible? And sure enough, like these, all this t stuff's happening, you know, the recent outer edge event, he had a, uh, an event, um, you know, on the side where they did a Pink Floyd uh, tribute concert and they're you're dropping NFTs. If you're in there in these app that they had built, you know, that you could have trading cards, physical trading cards and, you know, redeem different things in this app that was geo fenced and all this stuff. I was like, wow. Um, but he was an early member of our community. You know, he, he's being that really awesome guy and saying, your guys podcast is my favorite podcast. I'm your number one fan. Right. And we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of fun folks like that, that were part of the, the very initial, you know, handful of, you know, somewhere between 10 and a hundred people tuning in and that just, you know, that spread, you know, and, and I, and I think again, it's like the, the higher caliber uh, of people, whether they've already achieved something or they're just those ambitious people that know where to pay attention, you know, and get where to get where they need to go. Terrific. Yeah. So, you know, I was emceeing your event and on stage, I introduced Neil Strauss and also, you know, Bobby hundreds and, I just listened to Tim Ferriss' podcast and Bobby Hundreds is on there, introduced by Neil Strauss. So I think you guys have a hand in that. And I really recommend uh, everyone out in podcast land to listen to that one to help to understand better the you know NFT landscape and what those guys are doing. Let's let's take some a couple of more like cliff notes of some of your favorite uh, podcasts and ones that you would point our listeners to to uh, really highlight uh, some of the the Web three magic. Man, uh, let me just add to the previous point. Um, we've heard so many stories of people that have met through um, through our events, and that's sort of the magic of of a physical events that can't be replicated through webinars and, and virtual events um, very easily, at least not yet. Um, and it, it's always cool to see those stories. Um, you know, at one point, Spotty Wi-Fi told us that 
um, he collaborated on a song with Jim Jones because he met him because they were both performing at the first NFTLA. And um, I've heard from folks that got their, got, got checks from investors or met co-founders or did all sorts of collaborations with people they met um, through the event. So it's, it's really nice to know that, um, you know, when you, when you, when you put people together in, in the right sort of environment, um, just there's a really long tail of, of, of co-creation that, that happens as a result. And our goal is to sort of accelerate that. Um, when it comes to favorites, um, Rich, you know, that's a diabolical question because, uh, because, you know, every show that you produce is special. Every guest is, is special in, in their own way. Um, I think that, you know, we've done over 250 plus episodes at this point, and we've had over 550 speakers at our events. And, um, you know, it's a mosaic in, in my mind in terms of, um, moments that that are memorable um it was really cool to have um g love from g love and special sauce on the same show as g money um having you know the two g's on on one show just kind of i think was a special moment um you know at one point we had uh, keith grossman talking about what he was doing at time and his vision there and then more recently, uh, Maya. That's my favorite episode. That's the time episode because I didn't know how much time magazine was so how, how, how incredible of a, of a thought leader he is. And like, that's, that's such an iconic media brand, but it's also just an icon itself, the front cover. And, and like, I, I was blown away like that, that that's my favorite child of all your, you know, nearly 1000. So if I may, thanks. Yeah, um, that was a, a special one, a special time. And of course, pretty soon thereafter, Keith left to go over to MoonPay. And, and then we had Maya on the show and, and learned about her perspective on, on where the space is going. Um, you know, we, we've also had um, Kathy Heckle on the show talking about her perspective on the metaverse, which in, in sort of fashion, the future of luxury. And, and that was a really special episode. Um, you know, we've had, you know, the, the co-founders of Nier on the show, uh, they announced sort of the, their big plans with, with boss, um, which happened live at Eat Denver. And, and that was a exciting moment, I think in, in mass adoption where, um, you know, as a programmer, you're able to, uh, to use traditional web to, uh, programming languages, um, to, to sort of build in Web3. And, and, and I think that was exciting. We've had a lot of memorable moments, a lot of, um, a lot of alpha uh, and breaking news uh, on the show. Um, it, it's all sort of special to me. What about you, Ethan? Well, you called out a lot. Um, I'll, I'll just say the one, and it happened several times um, on the podcast where, you know, you know, we're booking these sessions. There's a lot going on and you show up and you, you sit down and you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to that person who, who like, I, I, I know about and admire or whatever, you know? Um, yeah. G G love was just one that was interesting. And of course, uh, we had, uh, <laughs> we had Bob Dylan's, uh, son Jesse. on the podcast, Jesse. Yeah. And, uh, and I realized after the show, and not only is he just like a really cool guy doing really cool stuff, he was involved in in producing uh, a movie that I quote all the time called Kicking and Screaming with Will Ferrell. Uh, has one of my favorite movie quotes. Uh, 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 Coffee is the lifeblood that fuels the dreams of champions. Um, and, uh, but yeah, and, and I think especially the first one that came to mind uh, was Tom Bilyeu, you know, uh, you just, just, the years before uh, having this podcast, I'd be watching him doing his impact theory stuff and be inspired by that. And, uh, and then, Oh, there he is. And we're having a, a great, great old conversation with them. And then we're at, at NFT NYC hanging out with them, you know, and, and his crew and stuff like that. So um, th that's really enjoyable. And, and it, you know, you work really hard, you know, your whole life, you go through ups and downs and things like that. And you see little signposts along the way that you're on the right path. Right. Uh, and, and those are some of them. Fantastic. Uh, for those of you out there, I 
will include in some show notes uh, how to link to some of those podcasts. Thanks. And I loved your metaphor earlier, Josh, when you talked about your experience in the food startup and blending together the proper macros, you know, fat, carbs, and protein, but then uh, peppering them with salt and sugar and oil. Um, but you know, enough to make it delicious, but not, not unhealthy. And, uh, I think in some ways the, the macros of your founding team are a very fascinating blend of, you know, Ethan for you, you know, to have the sax player from Pink Floyd and your uh, musical background. And then you also have a freaking PhD in neuroscience. And then your, you know, really um, solid uh, professional background, you know, Josh, and then into the the startup scene, and then, you know, um, also uh, the uh, incredible, you know, kind of, you know, creative uh, background of, you know, your uh, your your third founder, um, Jeff. Jeff, 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 indeed. Right. And he has this, you know, real, real sort of like professional, but also flair and creative background as well, too. Like the way that you guys have all blended together, like tell us a little bit more about the three co-founder division of duties and how that communication style and how you guys have dealt with the bull to the bear and just some uh, anecdotes on your hero's journey. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Jeff, uh, Jeff went to, to Yale and, uh, you know, did a, did a lot in private equity and real estate. He also served, um, in the army and, and moved a lot of, uh, logistics. So that type of skill set has been critical to our journey from the perspective of, um, sort of dealing with the unpredictable and dynamic environment we we call web three and sort of um navigating um tough terrain which certainly has been the case over the last two years we can't really sugarcoat that um you know with situations like terra and ftx and 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 the impact that's had on our industry and and we've had to be nimble and and jeff's sort of um you know deep leadership experience has been critical in that regard um you know, my background is, is, is a hodgepodge of, um, you know, from consulting to sort of, um, you know, onboarding, uh, to, to, um, to business development and partnerships. So I tend to, uh, be sort of on that side of the house in terms of, um, you know, interacting with, um, our most strategic allies in the space and, and finding ways to to co-create with them and to um, amplify what they're doing, what we're doing, um, developing, you know, products and services that that actually make a difference and, and, and uh, make make people um, have uh, have the impact they're looking for. At the end of the day, as a media and event company, um, we, we offer, um, folks, uh, a, a megaphone to, um, to tell their story, um, similar to, um, this podcast. And we, 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 we hold, we cherish that, um, sort of responsibility and, and sort of try to sort of use the skills and experience that we have to sort of make those partnerships meaningful on both sides. Um, of course, you got to dot your I's and cross your T's, but you also have to bring the right energy um, and uh, strategy to those partnerships. So that's been a lot of my focus. Um, and, you know, Ethan's creativity has been uh, extremely important to the development of our show and our brand story and our narrative and uh, you know, so much more. Um, he was also the, the sort of, um, the, the creator of our initial, uh, NFT, uh, journey in the space, the spirit seeds that, um, about a hundred lucky people have that's, that's given them an entree into 
NFTLA and, and all sorts of other perks over the last few years. And uh, I'm sure I'm leaving out things that Ethan and Jeff have done because all of us have uh, really deep entrepreneurial backgrounds. And it's been so critical to um, to this company to to enter this uh, to into this sort of space as a united front um, because uh, it's easy to get sort of um, thrashed around, if you will, um, just given the dynamic nature of our of our space. But we still we still love it. It's guaranteed to get thrashed around. So as you're being thrashed around, Ethan, tell us something that you maybe bring from the world of music or from your uh, neuroscience background, some of the, some, something from your utility belt. Um, I kind of put you on the spot, like a discipline or perspective. Right. I mean, I think that just having the utility belt in the first pit place has been really integral to dealing with everything that's going on in the space. Um, so, you know, just, just from the fact that when we have outer edge LA, Josh can say, Hey, I've got this science panel I want you to host. And, oh, hey, I've got this music panel I want you to host, right? I've got this fashion panel you want to host. And I can kind of seem like a good fit for a lot of those uh, various things that are going on and hold conversations in these various domains. Um, so, so that's been really integral, um, you know, in, in the, the podcast and the event. Um, and also just kind of getting out there and, you know, we do our own things where we go to events and we network and we meet people and being able to have those, those conversations, uh, with people, you know, um, that are, that are specific in their domains, um, that I can go a little bit deeper on. So that, that's really useful. Um, specifically, uh, I also think of when I think of my musical background, you know, I've been in front of, I've been in front of people a lot in, you know, sort of presenting, you know, they say that people are more afraid of public speaking than, uh, you know, giving the eulogy at the funeral than being in the box. Uh, and so I've had a lot of that, you know, not only have I been on stage, you know, as a keyboard player in front of thousands of people, um, which is stressful <laughs> and, and improvising, you know, at that. Uh, and then also, uh, but everything down to teaching a college level, uh, you know, biology lab or statistics course. Um, and, you know, having to deal with ornery, you know, college students who are studying psychology and don't want to learn a thing about statistics. Um, so I've found, and, and Josh, you know, loves me and hates me for it. I'm a great improviser, you know, so I, I can, I can hold a conversation, uh, a new conversation, a new party, and that's recorded, you know, very quickly and be on the spot. And I've tried to bring that to, to, you know, our endeavors, you know, and, and help coach, coach everybody else in these situations where we need to do something in front of people or that's entertaining or, or that, that has some sort of aesthetic to it. Um, so I think that's, those are some of the places that those kind of skills have come in. Yeah. And beyond the statistics. What, what was the, uh, what was the title of your PhD? I want everybody's brain to explode. <laughs> I think you're going to remember, um, the, the, the PhD was focused on uh, statistical properties of bird songs, which is, which is kind of like, wow, the, the oddest place in neuroscience you can go. Um, but is, has that. Tell us one anecdote or insight from that. So I studied the Australian pied butcher bird, um, and published a paper on its song structure and compared it with the structure of musical, uh, musical structure. And we found that, you know, um, it, it wasn't an experimental study, so we can't draw any you know, big conclusions from it, but it was a, it was an analytical study. And we found that there was, there's strong evidence that, that just like human beings, uh, make an effort to balance, uh, both sort of like, um, rep repetition with variation. Um, the birds did the same thing. This is a type of bird that kind of has an improvisational sounding song. So we would take the sequence of songs that they had created and uh, found these kind of uh, sub elements within the songs. And we, we found that the birds that had basically a higher vocabulary, call it, they, um, they used it in a way that had more structure to it versus the, the birds that had uh, a smaller vocabulary. Well, they mixed it up a little bit more, you know, in, in the way that they presented it. And so it was, yeah, that, that's just kind of a very interesting. 
That is beautiful. The Australian Pied Butcher, is that what it's called? Australian Pied Butcher Bird. And they're called a butcher bird because of the way that they impale their prey on the, the thorns and barbs of the Australian outback. So the They'll grab like a wow. Even even the birds are brutal <laughs> in Australia. But they're very beautiful songs, um, and they're very cute, uh, and and they're very underrepresented. It's hard to go out. I mean, maybe it's been a few years since I've googled it, but it's hard to go out and find the type of recordings that I I had at, on hand to um, to study of the Australian pied butcher bird. Uh, they're beautiful, beautiful uh, singers, and they do all sorts of interesting stuff. So I, if I may just peel back a few things there, first of all, the most amazing, coolest thesis title I've ever heard in my life um, and probably ever will. Uh, what, what jumps out for me there is a great lesson for people is that the structure sets you free to be able to have this structure in place and then to be able to improvise both in, you know, being a entrepreneur, being a speaker, to be able to be present and have something fully loaded in your RAM, so to speak, and then read the audience and improvise and say other things like that, that's a superpower. And that's even in nature, you know, other birds with tiny little minuscule peanut sized brains uh, respond to that. So that's a, that's a, that's beautiful. Also our fearless leader, Yatsio, uh, chairman of Animoca Brands, you know, his mom's a Taiwanese opera singer. His dad's a Hong Kong. Chinese musician. He grew up in Vienna, Austria, and he had that musical foundation that then he started to write software around that and then build his entrepreneurial journey. So it's a kind of a fascinating, you know, uh, Paul Graham, founder of Y Combinator, has a book called Hackers and Painters and talks about people who paint, but, you know, maybe code and some of the uh, different sides of the brain and how that, how that comes together. So it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful blend. I, I love that, you know, structure and improvisation. And then all three of you guys have your own superpowers and you come together and you're building this, uh, uh, this media company. Tell us, tell us about some of the, the lessons learned along the way and what, uh, people out there in podcast land can learn. Yeah, man, where where to start? So so many uh lessons learned. I feel like we we still learn a few lessons every every week. If 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 you if if, if you come across the next board ape uh early, uh buy it. Yeah, <laughs> that was our biggest kicker is where we had a friend who was like, "What's this board ape thing?" You know, what is that? And we and I remember seeing like, what, who cares about what's written on that bathroom wall? I mean, what, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, you know, uh, yeah, man, I, I would say in, in terms of, um, podcasting, um, you know, don't, don't underestimate, uh, what, what, possibilities can unfold if, if you uh, create a, a show that, that uh, you know, there's this gravitational force of energy that, that's, that's possible here that I don't think we would have predicted. I, it wasn't sort of necessarily, um, we didn't have a roadmap when we started the podcast um, and, and so much has sort of come from it uh, that it's impacted all of our lives and so many other people. So um, that's, that's the biggest one, um, that, that comes to mind, uh, for me, it's just an insight around the power of, of creating conversation and, and what it can and lead to in, in, in business. And, and, you know, it's also really fulfilling. I, I guess another lesson learned is, um, people ask us, you know, advice around starting a podcast and, and, you know, don't don't do it uh, for for the money. Do it because you you love the the domain that you're you're in and, and you want to learn and, and explore with other curious people. And um, you know, good things will happen um, as, as a result. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons you can start a podcast, and it definitely helps to have a friend um, or two. Um, and and uh, it, it's it's a grind. Creating content is a grind. 
And um, I, I think one real lesson learned uh, from, you know, doing a lot of media on the road and, and going to different events and everything is, is think this, the, the media stack can, can, can get high really, really quickly. And it's a whole different ball game when you go outside of a normal cadence of content to handle. Oh, can, can you, can you explain that a little bit more? The media stack can get high. What do you mean by that exactly? Yeah. Like, like when you start to do, um, uh, content outside of a normal rhythm where you're doing three, four, five, ten 10 interviews a week, that it, it's like an exponential impact on, on a media company to process all that content. Um, so, so the scalability of, so we've learned our lessons now, right? When we go to an event, we might do three really good interviews instead of like a whole bunch of, of content because, uh, as, as you learn rich and, and as others probably have learned as well, all that editing, post-production, social, it, it really adds up to an overwhelming, uh, sort of, uh, debt that you have to end up paying for, for months afterwards. So, um, don't overdo it, I guess is, is one lesson learned. Yeah. Um, other lessons, uh, I mean, I, I've just learned that we, we have an incredible potential, you know, just, just among, you know, from, from the founding team all the way to the team that we've built. Um, I've learned a lot from, from Jeff and Josh and, and their experience, you know, existing experience building a, a high level startup, um, you know, have great standards and, and bring in great people at the higher levels of, of the organization um, that can, can make, make decisions uh, that trickle down, you know? Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's really powerful stuff. And, and I've just, like I said, I've seen it we we have an incredible capacity to do really incredible things with with the events that we've pulled off and um you know the way that we can continue to to hold down the fort with the the with the podcast and um yeah we didn't mention we didn't men mention the i think we were meant to there's a new podcast coming out yes alpha share some alpha yes yes this and you're i don't i think we and we mentioned this maybe on one other interview recently but we're just trickling out the information here um but we'll have an edge of AI podcast coming out very soon. Very excited about that. Um, and it's going to bring, uh, it's going to bring content that's going to appeal to, you know, a few audiences, including, including people who are in the field of AI, uh, but also, you know, folks that are just curious about it and, and want to understand it more deeply. And, um, and, uh, you know, we're going to talk about things like use cases as well and make sure people can say, oh, yeah, how do you do that? Right. How, how do you how do you actually implement chat GPT or, or how did that person make that beautiful art? You know, what kind of extra intel do you need to kind of take things to the next level with using these AI tools? And and how can I as a an everyday person? Right. That that's just being that just ran into this thing. Oh, I guess AI is here what do I do and, and deal with that in, in, uh, for lack of a better word, a more offensive than defensive way and, and saying, how can I, uh, how can I really dive in deep and quick and, and, and have an impact as opposed to kind of being run down by the whole, <laughs> the whole wave of what's going on. So yeah, that's, that's going to be really fun, uh, releasing that. And, um, and, um, yeah, I was just sharing w with Josh today about uh, I'll be doing a, a, a residency with with Jirasi, which is uh, a really prestigious um, artist residency. And uh, I'm doing that along with Nicole Buffett, um, who we, we both had previously done this residency. We found out after we started collaborating on the Spirit Seed uh, project um, that J Josh mentioned earlier. So I'll be using some of that time to... Uh, to, to finalize the, the artwork for that spirit seed project. Um, we have, a we have a hundred, like, like, tell us about that. What does that mean exactly? Is there a physical residency? Is it all virtual? Like what do you do during that? Uh, oh, it's a, it's a physical residency. It's in the Santa Cruz mountains of, um, California. And you know, it's, it's about five weeks. And this particular session is for cross disciplinary artists. Um, it's the same one that I did previously when, when I did it, Nicole did a more art focused one, but, you know, we've got astrophysicists, you know, joining and biologists and, and it's all people who are doing things that 
across the boundaries of, of the arts and sciences. Um, so that'll be really fruitful. And uh, the, so both, both the, thanks, both the next level of the, of the spirit seeds will come out of that as well as, you know, we'll be working hard to, to get the launch of the uh, AI podcast uh, while I'm, while I'm there. So yeah, lots of really cool stuff down the road. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. You know, so Naval Ravikant, you know, at Naval Naval uh, on Twitter, and he has this great, you know, tweet stream called uh, how to get rich and, you know, kind of unfortunately named, but very relevant. And he talks about, I share this with the people that I mentor and my students that previously you needed capital and labor, uh, but now it's software and media and um, everybody kind of has democratized access to software and, and media more or less. Like anyone can be a media company and start a podcast. And, you know, Gary V talks a lot about how you should be producing content. And if you produce bad content, it's okay. That kind of just trickles away. But if you, uh, start to get into the rhythm and flow and create stuff that people want, then it's a fantastic high leverage way to be able to create a, a following and have an unfair advantage as a startup. So, you know, in many ways, what you guys start with that podcast, you did it really well. And that's a kind of the roots of the tree that's allowed you to grow the, you know, outer edge event and other events. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how you guys grow and evolve from there. Thanks. And, um, you know, thanks for, for being part of the journey. Um, you know, for those that don't know, Animoca Brands is, is one of our um, early investors. We went through the Brink. Proudly so. Thank you. And went through the Brink Accelerator Program and it opened up so many doors for us. And 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 we were looking for that person at Animoca Brands that could, um, you know, help us uncover all the opportunities to co-create within that ecosystem. And then lo and behold, we meet you, Rich. Yeah, they said, they said, hey, hey, Rich, we're looking for somebody inside Animoca who's funny, smart, and charming, and we can't find anybody. So would you work with us instead? And I said, absolutely. I'm happy to do it. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and they, they, they uh, took sort of the requirement for a sexy head of hair off the, off the um, criteria, and, and lo and behold, Rich, Rich, uh, Rich in his role was born. But... Um, you know, the, I, I think another fun story is is, is how we met. Um, we 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 wanted to um, help uh, Animoca Brands do an event uh, to to bring the portfolio together, and so um, you know we, we we did something and at, in New York around the time of NFT New York, and um, it, it was uh, meant to be a, a quote small gathering of. Um, you know, some of the portfolio. And, and I just was like, I was thinking about it. I'm just like, wait a second here. Uh, with our audience and in, in, in Animoca's audience and, and sort of the size of the portfolio, I don't know how small this event is going to be. And we, we needed Hodor from Game of Thrones to just be like, Hodor, Hodor. It was just an absolute rush of bodies. Yeah. So even though we, um, you know, we, we told people, um, you know, no more, no more room. It didn't, it didn't stop the masses from, from coming. So, you know, we, we have this rooftop uh, hotel, uh, I think in Soho ish. And, um, you know, there's, I'm upstairs and, and I see the line piling up and then I kind of look into it and there's another line in the hallway. And then there's another line downstairs at the elevator. And then there's another line outside the building wrapped around the building. Um, so With like pitchforks and torches, like let's go. Right. It was an absolute, like uh, just overwhelming, like mutiny almost. I want in. So, so, but, but that was a lesson learned too. I guess back to your earlier question is, um, you know, when you do an event, uh, edge and Animoca plan on a little, you know, plan on more people than you might have anticipated. <laughs> And now uh, pay close attention to the bar tab. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Excellent. Ethan, Janney, Joshua, Krieger, and, you know, not here. Jeff Kelly, thanks so much. Uh, the co-founders of The Edge of Company. I really look forward to 
future podcast episodes, your future new podcast, Edge of AI and future events. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, Rich. Thanks so much. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice. Any opinions provided in this podcast reflect the views of the speakers only.